Well, thank you. I'd like to invite all of our panelists up to, um, up to sit here together so we can have a conversation also with the audience. So um, thank you all so much. So this was our historical panel, and I think it fulfilled its brief in all kinds of fantastic ways. And um, I'm just here to moderate um, a conversation, not to sort of officially respond. I have all kinds of thoughts and questions, but I, um, I think, uh, I guess I might want to ask if, if any of you would like to say something first about your thoughts about being placed uh, together. I mean, obviously, there were all kinds of um, themes that have have been repeated. I mean, sort of the ideas of um, uh, Soviet art and the local, for example, certainly from your paper, but also, I think, in, in interesting ways from yours, Maria, with the the kind of interest in this local global of the of um, the Egyptians. Um, Friendship monuments have come up a lot. I, I wasn't thinking about, I mean, Ernstny and Vietnese in relation to the ones you showed is, is interesting. And then the Ernstny Vietnese brings in a kind of modernism that was really in Ingenia's talk. I mean, because I think you're talking on some level about a, the kind of modernist city plan and its total transformation. And then this extraordinary video you showed at the end, which sort of is, it seems in its, its own way modern. Um, so I think that there's all kinds of things to, to, to jump in on, but I, I think the idea would be to see if you want to talk to each other at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know, <laughs> you know each other. Um, and then to see what, what the audience might want to ask all of you. I'm happy to maybe say a few words uh, first, and maybe um, in relation to Katya's uh, paper, and it's something that um, I've reflected on a little bit in my own work on socialist realism and the creative mistakes that have often been um, um, kind of put up almost kind of in a show trial sort of way where artists were denounced. Um, uh, as well as arrested and um, persecuted and executed uh, from both um, uh, within Soviet Russia but also Ukraine and Latvia and you've named a few and I'm interested um, to see how the conversation or kind of I guess um, the situation changes in the post-war period, but also I think in the interwar period of where um, the uh, kind of the arm of censorship is not as strict when it comes to external um, and foreign artists who engage in kind of conversation who are celebrated in the Soviet uh, Union. So you can see that, you know, with the work of Hamid Awais, which I think in terms of the conversations of the national, for example, and the modern, uh, is quite similar uh, to um, the work that you were um, showing in in um, the first presentation, and um, how that uh, th the national can be instrumentalized for very different reasons. And of course, um, it's a very kind of you know, it's okay for some, but not mm. okay for others. So kind of this fraternity mm -hmm. and internationalism and friendship, you can see how it's kind of very murky and uh, is cannot be um, said that it's homogenous in any way in terms of state policy. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it's a particular, a uh, it's not a question, but it's a mm. remark. So I don't know if... Yeah, uh, no, and um, you're exactly right. That's exactly what I was thinking when I was listening to your presentation is how this duplicity in the mm. messaging yeah. um, that on the one hand kind of uh, something that was local and national was actively um, 
destroyed, executed, and um, just kind of obliterated from, from the existence. And at the same time, the same regime could embrace it somewhere else for that to kind of to propagate their political agenda. So it, it was incredibly interesting to kind of this juxtaposition mm -hmm. of kind of the messaging and also the techniques of what kind of uh, what was um, used, how art was used mm -hmm. in um, sort of in the late 1920s, 19, early 1930s, or through 1930s, and then with the death of Stalin, and kind of when things changed a little bit ideologically, how that kind of what was denied was then actively embraced again, mm -hmm. um, when mm -hmm. it came again to kind of somewhere else, mm. not to mm. the brotherly nation. So it, it, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking as well, that kind of, um, I thought our presentations give just a very interesting ju juxtaposition of how the same narrative can be used yeah. so differently to kind of, um, yeah, just for political reasons. And, and to uh, pick up and um, drive it to the Friendship Monument, it's interesting that with Ernst Niesviesny, can he, uh, the representation on display of his work can be denied in Soviet mm. Moscow, but mm. then celebrated mm -hmm. uh, abroad and, a and kind of utilized Mm -hmm. to serve a very different purpose. And it was also very interesting that it's a very formalistic mm -hmm. work. It's not social socialist realism, it's like very modern yeah. in its um, outlook, so it's fascinating how mm. kind of the language, the visual language that was denied existence in the Soviet Union could then be used um, to kind of advance the messaging somewhere else. Right, although I feel like in the, by the 1970s in the Soviet Union, there is this also this kind of monumental modern becomes another language of, I mean, it's not obviously realism, but it becomes something you see everywhere, this kind of monumental sort of semi-abstract. Um, but I think you're right that that, that Ernst Nezvesny is particularly abstract. I'm also interested in your, in, in Boychuk and what happened, you know, the tragedy of what befell him and, and his, uh, the people he worked with. And um, is it your impression that when the works were systematically destroyed, were they destroyed because of an actual dislike of the Ukrainian national form, or do you think they were destroyed because they were works of art made by enemies of the people who had themselves been executed, and they were executed because of this nationalist deviation rather than for something that they actually... I'm, I'm always interested in this, mm. and with their, their, that often when artists are are, are um, repressed in that way. It's, um, it's, not, it's not because of the art they made, it's because of who they were. Mm. And, then it, and then the art ends up being destroyed. But I, I'm just curious, in this case, I, I actually don't know. I think it was, it's a very good point, mm -hmm. and um, it's a complicated, um, Baichuk and his school was an extremely complicated um, question and kind of subject. And I think it was a combination of both okay. uh, to an extent. I think kind of the work was destroyed because um, it was created by specifically Boychuk and his school. But at the same time, like a decade later, or even five years later, they were celebrated as like mm -hmm. the best that Ukrainian art has produced. Yeah. And kind of their murals, they covered mm -hmm. lots of like theaters, um, factories, mm -hmm. sanatoriums, they were everywhere, like mm -hmm. on public display. And they kind of, I think kind of the point that I was starting to make, but I didn't want to go into quite as much detail, they did embrace, embrace socialist realism and they did adjust their visual language. And I don't think it was particularly kind of, there was an element of coercion there, but also I think it was the kind of the natural evolvement of mm -hmm. their visual language, given the sort of the political situation and social political situation. So they kind of reflected on the ideology and they incorporated it in their work. So it's it's bizarre that then kind of everything was systematically erased, mm -hmm. seeing that they actually kind of embraced the mm -hmm. kind of, especially their later works, they're very much socialist realism. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think it was a combination that on the one hand, kind of the authorship who produced those works. But also kind of another thing that um, is key with Boychuk is, is that one of the main things for them was peasantry. So they were kind of, they were portraying kind of workers were also a big thing, but they were mostly interested in kind of, because mm -hmm. from where Boychuk and many of his students came from, they were kind of peasant origin. They were celebrating kind of peasantry in Ukraine and they recognized Ukrainian culture to an extent as a peasant culture because kind of that was the main social strata of the of the country for a really long time. So I think it was also this kind of the embracement and celebration of the peasantry rather than the kind of working class that 
probably mm, didn't was uh, kind of exactly mm -hmm. and uh, especially as Jenya mentioned, kind of in the 1930s, there was Holodomor when kind of the peasantry was kind of erased. Four and a four and a half, four point five million people died in the architectural, oh, um, um, architecturally constructed, artificially constructed <laughs> famine. You've so got the best Freudian slips today. <laughs> yeah. I know. I'm sorry. Like I'm like, the don't analyze me, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, um, so what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say is that kind of peasantry, this kind of peasant roots and peasant imagery became less susceptible mm -hmm. um, under Stalin, and that gotcha. was a problem mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can add uh, yes. a bit about uh, architecture, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know that case about Chervono Zavatsky Theater? Mm -hmm. So uh, that is exactly in that proletariat district that I've shown you in that linear part. That is historical proletariat object uh, that was before the revolution. Uh, Narodny Dom, it means like people's house. And uh, exactly in the 30s, it was a big competition on that uh, project. And Bychuk should make interiors and murals all over the building inside. And uh, after 1934, actually, he was already criticized before he was executed. And uh, uh, that works that he drawn there, uh, like uh, industrialization and uh, collectivization, uh, they were called like distortion from reality. So mm. like he distort mm. people uh, and publicity mm -hmm. from real reality. So people are too dark, they are too tired, they are mm -hmm. too dramatic, they mm -hmm. are heavy. Uh, mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. is like bad things. He, mm -hmm. They said that he manipulated. Yes, it wasn't the rosy. Yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't something like happiness. That. So mm -hmm. they, he, he produced even in 1934. He already tried to combine something with socialist reali reali realism, but they didn't like uh, mm -hmm. his socialist realism. Mm -hmm. And then he was executed. Mm -hmm. So it's like a mm -hmm. part of evidence for his case, actually, of uh, execution case uh, then. And uh, it was demolished, totally demolished. Mm -hmm. But for example, my NGO, we found some small piece oh, yeah. uh, under, under plaster. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. we didn't uh, gain uh, any uh, understanding with factory authorities that uh, we should open up that. Because they were scared that then that object will be national listed. And then they, they would, they would to <laughs> have <laughs> no possibility to sell <laughs> that or to do yeah. some bad things with that object. But it's still there. Or yeah, it's still there. They haven't destroyed it. But small piece. There was also, I think, a couple of years ago in Odessa, they uncovered they some uncovered. Um, mm -hmm. murals that are kind of considered to be by Bychuk school. Mm -hmm. But I was actually in Odessa last uh, September, and I went to the building to see if I could actually look at them, and they're completely covered. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not showing them, and it's unclear whether they actually want to, like, uncover them and do some restoration work to kind of mm -hmm. to show them. Um, I wanted to ask you, Zhenya, you said this really fascinating thing that the NKVD, so the secret police, had a city planning department? Actually, yes, and actually that big and huge and famous uh, organization that in Moscow called Gipragorod uh, uh -huh. and in Ukraine Dipramista or Giprograd, uh -huh. that is former NKVD department. Uh, architectural department of NKVD. So I think, th yeah, they that is very, very power. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and when, you know, people talk about that utopian experiments <laughs> in urban planning, uh, and uh, let's talk about utopian cities, cities are so fascinating, some beautiful architects, they may be so talented and so Marxist that they decided to design that beautiful cities for beautiful people. I think it's some misunderstanding, because actually who designed that utopian cities, they were NKVD workers. Mm -hmm. Because even Manucharova, she, she has actually documents that she is a NKVD worker. Mm -hmm. yeah, so well, it's like NKVD work. architect. It's a bit like tra tradition, maybe French tradition of prefect Asman or something mm -hmm. like that, when prefecture mm -hmm. actually and police actually mm -hmm. uh, make plans. That is somehow understandable. For example, for now, if uh, the fourth wave of mobilization will be in Ukraine, I should be on the war uh, mm -hmm. because uh, I'm engineer and I should mm -hmm. make plans. Mm -hmm. And then I even like felt, even, even in my body, I felt mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, I can draw actually uh, some military plan. <laughs> so my mm -hmm. education is exactly for drawing military plans mm -hmm. and military cities mm -hmm. and uh, with all the shelters actually, mm -hmm. that is a part of uh, defensive architecture. Well, so especially because you can do both, you can do the architecture and the planning. Like yeah, and even, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even theory. And even theory. You're forced to be reckoned with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> 
they shouldn't uh, hire me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Micha, do you have anything burning you want to share with the group? Um, no, I mean, there's, there's so many, like, yeah, there's so many um, connections and uh, comparisons and, and thoughts and lines and circles, but I think maybe it makes more sense to okay. open up to the I audience. I just wanted to give you that chance. So Thank do you. people have, we hope that you have questions for us? Thank you, and thanks for a very wonderful panel. I enjoyed all of, all of your talks. Whoops. Um, I have a very general question uh, and a more specific one. Um, the general question is about the language we have to conceptualize both uh, Soviet internationalism but also the current war that is going on, and we use uh, colonialism, post-colonialism, imperialism, neo-imperialist, uh, that was something that went uh, 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 through all your talks. And uh, uh, Michael, you, you uh, taught me a new word about eco-imperialism that I really, <laughs> uh, really enjoyed. Um, but all, uh, all of our theoretical language is developed in Western theory building, and it's based on a notion of the West colonializing uh, an Orient. And here we have like the reverse uh, process of a subaltern empire that colonializes uh, Poland, for example, which was a more industrialized or more developed country than Russia was. Um, if we look at the current like global reaction to the war, all the BRIC countries like Brazil, China, India, South, South Africa, they have avoided to take a stance in the conflict and they kind of distance themselves from this. This is white Europeans killing white Europeans for change. And this is not even true because among the conscript soldiers there's a strong overrepresentation uh, of people from Caucasus in, in the Russian army. So I was just wondering if you could reflect about this like current uh, a global dimension of of the war in relation to um, your historical examples of art. And then back to this uh, more specific thing about the eco-imperialism. Um, it's, it's a brilliant way to describe Sariyatje Park because uh, it's just spot on, spot on. But as far as I remember, this park was designed by a New York-based uh, like star architects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, uh, to which extent are we in the West kind of com complicit uh, in this eco-imperialism? I know, just for your information as Danish taxpayers, <laughs> that uh, Denmark has uh, invested massively <laughs> in kind of uh, in cultural export of mm -hmm. Copenhagen urban planning. Now we have to learn Moscow how to uh, go on bikes and make a more mm -hmm. comfortable, more like Western lifestyle city center. And this part of making Moscow a green urban center that is comfortable for the elite. I think that's also something that we have been part of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and this uh, marble pavement that you got everywhere, so that people. Uh, can can walk easily around in in the city. It it's kind of a parallel to to your presentation that it's so um, it's it's so impossible to to live on marble stones. Right? Yeah, I don't know. It, it's perhaps more common than a question. Thanks. Should I start? I think you should. Um, yeah, that's an extremely rich question. It's almost a presentation in itself, but you pick <laughs> up on many of the themes that I think w all of us kind of um, could have gone down uh, further. I mean, the geopolitical question is so huge, so perhaps I'll try to um, defer the answer to that question to <laughs> somebody else. Um, <laughs> or I'll just answer it implicitly through my attempt to answer your question about Zaryadia and eco-imperialism and to what extent is this like a Russian specificity or is it a general Western thing and how is Denmark implicated in this? <laughs> and it is really, oh yeah, so the Zariadi was designed by a, a kind of 
fashionable New York practice called Dillis Cofidio and Menfros, as you know, and they like to cite Donna Haraway and like Rinna Latour in their in their in their architectural um, ideology papers. And um, they also design the High Line in, in New York and many other things. And the High Line is this kind of bullet of gent eco gentrification running through a lower Manhattan, which has had a like a social cleansing effect on on New York City, and which um, also is built and maintained by people who are ethnically, racially distinct from the people who use it to, to, to a large extent. So there's many parallels, and I think in my work before 2022, in my attempt to write my book now about Moscow, Lago Ustros, for this urban planning, I was emphasizing these parallels, that the, these processes are equivalent, that these processes of hierarchization, exploitation, um, these are all built into a kind of extractive um, system which is similar in distinct but commensurable between the US and Russia. And I emphasized in my work the, the real, like the, that which is hidden behind the kind of shrubbery of the High Line versus Zaryadia, the kind of the, the, the repressed or the kind of um, the, the latent truth um, as being labor exploitation. Um, but yeah, as I kind of insinuated um, in my presentation, uh, it's becoming clear to me that there is something <laughs> that it's, it's not possible to make that com necessarily that, com that comparison so smoothly. And I'm trying to isolate the distinction. And I think that, yeah, the, the, the presence of, of war, the, the portents of fascism and of death are so many in the case of the Moscow um, projects, not just Zaryadia, that they're impossible to ignore. And it's pretty interesting, actually, that Jan Gell, who is this Danish kind of superstar planner who's been hired by various authoritarian regimes and non-authoritarian regimes all over the world as a kind of consultant um, for their livable city project. Moscow, incidentally, was named the most livable city in the world, I think in January 2022, one of, one, <laughs> one of these like bullshit rankings that yeah. they don't, I think it was the UN actually who, who did the ranking. Um, so good timing. Um, but Jan Gell is this livability like um, uh, commissar who travels around the world <laughs> to lend his expertise. And he was hired, I think in 2011, 2012 by, by, by Moscow to like do his, apply his trade, and he, he was repeatedly cited in interviews as expressing delight in how in Moscow it's great because you just drive in a taxi and you tell the chief architect to put a bicycle path here and make a park here, and then two weeks later it's there already, <laughs> and it's fantastic. And he was, he was <laughs> delighting at how there is an abs absence of like, democratic <laughs> procedures and how this power vertical enables this like, eco-livable vision to be implemented. Um, unequally, of course, between the centre and the, and the peripheries and elsewhere. So yeah, there's definitely some sort of cleavage between the eco and the vertical, but I haven't quite figured it out yet. Well, yeah, I mean, this is really interesting. Could you just repeat what she said? Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned this, this idea that the, that the locals, that the people of Moscow came and destroyed the park. And this is really interesting because this is a, like, uh, there is this idea of the gift, which is inherent to public space projects, I think, in, in Russia. Also, in the Palace of Culture was framed as a gift from Stalin to the people of Poland, whereas the, the Park Zariadia was framed as a gift from... Um, Sobyanin stroke Putin to the people of Moscow um, and the people were supposed to be grateful recipients <laughs> of the gift but then when Park Zaryadia opened it said that the people of Moscow came and they trampled all over the park they defecated in the pond uh, they fucked in the bushes like they they defiled the park and they failed to act as th these are not just things I've made up these are from the from the press uh, that they failed to act appropriately as, as grateful model citizens yeah. <laughs> as, as grateful people and this idea that the park was destroyed was was made up like they the park wasn't ready they opened it too soon and so like some stuff was like some people trampled a bit of a bit of um 
a bit of uh, turf. But, so, but, but the notion of this ungrateful barbarians defiling and destroying the park was elevated by the press and by the kind of public culture to a phenomenon. And remarkably, exactly the same thing happened in 1928 after the opening of, uh, of Gorky Park. Mm -hmm. It was also closed and the Soviet press uh, expressed their disgust and disappointment <laughs> in, at the ungrateful behavior of the... Uh, but uh, uh, is, I'm it is, at you, but is it the same, the part of the behavior of the soldiers actually in Ukraine? In Ukraine. Yeah. So maybe mm. that is something about them actually. Mm -hmm. And maybe when Gail is very optimistic about mm -hmm. participation projects, he should think about that type of society. And maybe mm -hmm. uh, Russian architects like Revzin should think what new participation projects about some growing up of development of that uh, intellectual development of the people they should involve. I, uh, so there is something about responsibility of architects, mm -hmm. actually. So yes, for exactly. uh, all the second part of the 20th century, we talk about responsibility of the architect, uh, usually criticizing modernist architects. And for example, as I mentioned, uh, that our main hero of that movie, it was uh, Lotta Stambeze from the 20s and 30s. And mm -hmm. my friend Haneke Osterhoff, she wrote her dissertation about that female architect exactly because in 1993 it was a book about uh, Lotta Stambeze that was written by some white men. And uh, he concluded his book about her, about her biography. So how should we remember them? Them, it means all that foreign architects who worked in Soviet Union and took part actually in all that regime actions and the NKVD mm -hmm. department actually. And my friend, she was so angered uh, with, with such formulation that she decided to make some other dimension of that biography, how that personality actually took part and what she felt. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so as the results of that dissertation, I, I think, uh, described some personality, very contradictional personality of that Comintern architect, Lotta Stambeze, very leftist architect. But at the same time, what, um, what I felt after all that studies of Lotta Stambeze, that she really felt herself in Kharkiv or in Soviet Union like witnesser. Uh, so she just witnessed something but she can do nothing actually. And why she ex escaped? She actually escaped not because she saw a lot of corpse on the streets. She escaped because she said that uh, her role of architects actually just to, to, to implement and to realize some orders. But her role as an architect should be different. Uh, and uh, it was much more professional uh, things like about that hierarchical type of uh, decision-making process in architectural sphere in usual in Soviet Union, in Russian Empire and so on. Mm. So I think that take part, it depends how you take part. Because for example, Lotte's uh, intention first was to help. And what, for example, I witness now as a Ukrainian, that a lot of people want to help us. For example, Norman Foster really want to help Kharkiv and to draw a new master plan for Kharkiv. But how he will help, mm. that is the question. So Russians, they want to help us too. They want to denisificate us, yeah? <laughs> or maybe to free uh, us or something like that. So everybody actually usually want to help. And I think that it depends And architects and urban planners. They really want to help. So uh, I think it's really the question how you will help. That is the point. And how young Gail should help that Russian people who, who don't like parks. Actually, yeah, and the the trope of the gift as well. I mean, I've l like just been googling, like g searching in my Telegram for the use of the word gift in various Telegram channels since the war started, and yeah, since the full scale invasion, and the the um, in the, the denazification operation is portrayed as a gift, and the statue of the Babushka Z in Mariupol is, according to Russian propaganda, a gift from the Russian military to the people of Mariupol. So this language of the gift is really emphasized. That is uh, the language of help, aggressor. That yes, is actually exactly, the language yeah. of, of rape culture, because mm -hmm. rape was a gift too, actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> usually. They said that mm -hmm. that is the gift. Can I see if there are other questions? Because we're sort of running out of time. It's been a great discussion, but I'm imagining someone else must have a question for us. Okay, Yvette. <laughs> <laughs> Amasha, this question is for you. I'm quite curious about um, Ernst Niesviesny, because I don't know how many years, okay. two years after that monument, he immigrates. Mm -hmm. And he's also a strong representative of the dissident movement. 
after that, mm -hmm. especially the Jewish dissident movement. So it was very, it's, I'm just very curious if there's any, if you know anything about that aspect about he does a monument in Cairo and then he becomes the front figure artist for mm -hmm. uh, Soviet Jewish dissidents. Yeah, I think this is, uh, that's such a great question. And um, I started doing some research into the mun monument and so far I haven't got anywhere apart from just <laughs> discovering the fact that this is by Anthony Vesne, which mm. kind of just uh, put so many exclamation marks in, in, in my notes. Mm. Um, so uh, this is research that needs to be done and you make a very important point that he makes just uh, a few years after and, and becomes a symbol of, of, of Jewish kind of uh, dissident and resistance really and uh, it just shows also that there are so many more kind of unanswered uh, questions that um, uh, us as historians uh, should attend to yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay anyone else there are a reticent audience mm -hmm. um, but then a I think, and a hungry audience, yes, because <laughs> our questions stand between you and your lunch. So, um, <laughs> if we have reached the end of our time, so a successful first panel, if nothing else in terms of time, but then in terms of so many other things. So, <laughs> thanks to all of you.